Working farmer style. Farmer style. Work, 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 working farmer style. Hey, for my shadow. Work, 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 working farmer style. Hey, from the field. Work, 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 work. Farmers are working harder than you might imagine. But that is just because we have a job that is our passion. We will work sun up to sundown time and time again. As if working for the Lord and not for men. Out here on the farm, we get away from lights of cities. Out here on the farm, the countryside is nice and pretty. Out here on the farm, we work together as a family. Out here on the farm, on the family farm. Agriculture is so important to me and should be to you. Hey! In the world and we'll never ever cease to be. We need to aid. We all need farmers to provide us with the food, 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 food. Working farmer style. Welcome to WTF Wants to Farm where we discover Pono Farming Projects. Highlight special series, cover farming events, and show all the aspects on how to farm. Please enjoy the show. Farmer style. Work, 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 work in farmer style. Hey, for my cattle. Work, 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 work in farmer style. Hey. Work, 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 work eh, 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 eh. is what we feed our cattle so they grow big and strong and then become the food that keeps us living nice and long. Our crops like corn and wheat help make diets complete. Without the farmers working, we would all be starving. You, you know, know what, what I'm saying? saying? Working farmer style. Eh, 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 eh. Thank a farmer. Work, 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 work in farmer style. Eh, Leilani again with Want to Farm. Today we're at Maui College Molokai Farm for our final episode, the Molokai Natural Farming Series. Inputs with Drake Weiner. Here, I'm just I'm just gonna quickly go through these because there's a lot of pictures, and I'm just I'll just go through it kind of quickly, and then at the more important parts, I'll I'll fill in a little better. But I just I just wanted to kind of show you. Um, this is the um, well. I don't know, you can read this slide of kind of the, the old paradigm of ignoring the biology uh, that we're, we're in farming where, you know, you just kind of go out and just, just run the soil over and just pretend like the thing is dead and just kind of ignore the thing. Um, and now we sort of got a new paradigm emerging where we have more, um, you know, permaculture and polyculture and all these different ideas. but. A lot of permaculture guys, I kind of feel like they're hoping that the correct biology will show up. You know, they, they put a banana here and taro there and they're, they're hoping it'll work um, by, by the plant level. But for me, I really go down to the microorganism level and I'm farming microorganisms. The plants just happen to be there and they're feeding my microorganisms um, and me. But the natural farming paradigm is intentionally seeding the best biology. So you're coming into an environment and you're intentionally seeding the best stuff there and then you're feeding it so that your environment and your soil becomes this rich living area that whatever you do is farming on top, if you got good soil, you can have good plants. And so natural farming kind of start with the soil and seeding the best stuff. And Basically, as, an, as a natural farmer and as a Korean natural farmer, um, there are these eight tools that Cho has created, uh, Master Cho has created, that are the optimal. That I've learned a lot, I've been doing this for years, and I've found all these different methods, but Cho and his tools, and if you can follow them and do them correctly, 
and read through the translation and figure out how to do it. They're the best. And so essentially he has the first tool over there is oriental herbal nutrient, which is the medicine to the system. So by providing the right medicine to the system and um, it gets things going, you know, it, it gets things healthy. Um, and the cool thing about this is this medicine, you cannot overdose. If you use it daily, you're not going to build up resistance and it's going to always provide healthy, healthy benefits for your system. The next thing he has is BRV, which is brown rice vinegar. And vinegar goes into a system and it helps shift. So if you had something that was acidic, it's going to flip and become alkaline. And whatever molecule or whatever was stuck on that is now released because you've changed the charge. And now this site is clear for some other nutrient that you just added to bind to it. And so you can get better nutrient absorption and also kind of flush out the junk stuff with BRV. And it also helps to change um, the soil from being very acidic to being more alkaline by using it. Then we have the FPJ, which is the one that we did here. Uh, this can be made from a variety of different plants, but essentially it provides the food for the system. So the food for the microbes and your plants. Then they have FAA, which is fish amino acid. And this is fish that's been broken down with sugar. It's just like fish sauce, um, the um, high quality fish sauce. And what this does is it's real important in the beginning as kind of the fuel to get things kick-started because it has all these essential amino acids in there that for a very young plant, it's hard for them to create them. But if you provide them externally by putting them on, you get really fast, rapid growth. Although as fuel, you can also trigger overgrowth. So too much usage of this or at the wrong time, you can cause overgrowth. You know, if you got a big fire and you dump like 100 gallons of gas on it, thing is going to blow up. And same thing with this. So you want to be very um, careful with its usage, but it can get things going. The next one is um, water-soluble calcium phosphate. And it's important that it's water-soluble because this means it can immediately go into the cell. Uh, other types of calcium or phosphate, uh, phosphorus that you use have to go through a different system, but this is water soluble. And what this does is it helps the plant where it's grown out and got a whole bunch of carbohydrates by growing, and it helps it change those carbohydrates now into sugars as it starts to go into its reproductive stage. And so the, the calphos helps the, the plant to move these things around. And, this probably is one of the more vital uh, ingredients to use because going from growing to reproduction is a dramatic change in the plant in terms of how its systems are working. And this really helps to aid that process of going from growing to now reproducing. It, it, the way it moves those um, and, and changes the way the plant is working. Um, then there is water-soluble calcium, calcium without the phosphorus. And this helps to move the energy now into your fruits. So once your plant has already started to set a small little fruit, you know, like you got a little lime there, the flower's falling off and you got a little lime, then you start applying the water-soluble calcium and it's going to take all the nutrients and pump it into that fruit. That fruit's going to grow. It's also going to strengthen the skin of that fruit so that it can contain that, um, that sugars and waters and things um, and then the then we have up here lactic acid bacteria and again I say it's kind of like the National Guard or the Red Cross it's kind of like the emergency workers after you've created a natural disaster by digging something up it's a good time to use it um, you trip and spill all your stuff on the ground you're like oh no what do I do LAB put it on there it'll help remedy any situation um, like if all of a sudden you get some crazy bacterial wilt come in or something, uh, you know, something infects you, you can go out and spray LAB and it's going to help remedy that situation quickly. Um, I know, uh, yeah, I'll, just, I'll leave it at that. 
Um, and then the last one up here is IMO, which is indigenous microorganisms. And these are the microbes that are already living near you that you take and you put them through a training program to train them into um, superheroes. Um, like, like the way I, the way I like to say it is like your IMO that are already there are kind of just working with the soil and with the dirt and they're making clay houses and they're like, you know, mud huts and they're living in there and they're living all right. But you take them and you put them into this training program and then they're able to go out and to take that same thing they were making a mud hut out of and now they can make a skyscraper with reinforced concrete. And they learn how to use the materials there better. And they can go and teach the other microbes. They can be like, oh, I see you're just living in this mud hut. Check this out. You can make hempcrete, and now you can make a skyscraper, you know? And so they can move the guys out of the ghetto into, you know, Babylon or... <laughs> <laughs> what I want to do is um, introduce you to natural farming a little bit. And we're going to go through um, two demonstrations of how to actually make uh, the inputs that we're using in natural farming. And, um, and then we can go and look at the microscope to see kind of what's in the soil. Because understanding your microbiology and what's happening in the soil is the way to get sustainable, to get the soil so it starts cycling and taking care of itself and how we can get it back to that situation. So what we're doing up here right now is making one of the first tools of the natural farmer, which is FPJ, which is just an acronym right now, but what it stands for is fermented plant juice. And so what he's going or what he's doing right here is cutting the banana flower and then we're going to mix that with sugar to get the best juice out of it. This is fermented plant juice. Um, this is the Korean way. Um, when they named all the inputs, the inputs are named by how you make them instead of by their use. So the process to make what we're making right here is to ferment plant juice. Pretty simple. And why we would make this is because this is the fundamental food of the system. So in, a, uh, in nature, when a plant's growing, grows up, then the leaves fall to the ground. The, then the leaves are fermenting on the ground and being digested in an external system. And then the plant is reuptaking them. What we're doing here is just optimizing what naturally happens. So the banana leaves fell into this bucket and then we're going to mix it with sugar to accelerate and make sure that that fermentation is a really high quality fermentation. And then we're going to get that juice out and then we're going to spray that back onto our plant. So we're still following this natural cycle of the, the leaf falling on the ground, it fermenting and then the plant re-eating that. We're just doing this extra step of getting just the best and finest quality stuff out of the banana. And what it allows us to do is to get not only just the, the nutrients in there, but also the hormones and the enzymes that are in this banana flower that, um, that are hard to manufacture in other ways. That the natural system already has the stuff that makes the banana grow in it. So instead of trying to like synthesize that some other place, we just get it right out of here. Um, this thing is really pretty easy to make. So what you saw Tubbs just did was he took the banana flower and he cut them up small so that this size is manageable. I can move this around. But notice he didn't grind them up the thing is still um, in its you know, pretty natural state. It was just cut up a little bit. And so we gathered the, de the desired plant. In this case, we didn't gather it before the morning dew, but it's the banana leaf, so it's a little bit different. 
what we're gonna do next, the second step here, is to loamy this guy with brown sugar. And so in Korean natural farming, we use a lot of brown sugar. Um, you cannot use white sugar and raw sugar just doesn't work very well. Brown sugar is the guy you want because what this does is it exerts osmotic pressure on the cells there to pull the best juice from the inside out. So without breaking the cell wall, we're just pulling the good juice across into our mixture. So what we want to do is take our banana stuff and I mix it inside a, a um, container. We just put it in there right now. And then we're going to coat the thing with brown sugar. So you can dump that one on. And ideally, you want to hit between half to two thirds by weight with your brown sugar because that's enough sugar to then coat all of your leaf material or all, of, all the material you're working with. And so then he's gonna loam them a little bit. Just rub them in so you're not, you're not trying to smash it, you're just trying to agitate and mix it so the sugar gets all over the, the plant material you're working with. And Nah, so, so the tubs asked me to add a little bit more, but when I'm looking at them right now, it has enough on it. I can see that one pound of sugar so far into, how much banana flour is this? So one pound of sugar went to two banana flours, and this right here is already packed. And if you see this stuff right now, it's kind of dry, yeah? But watch, as we, as we massage this thing around a little bit, watch what happens. So just try a lomium. So he's gonna loam me that around a little bit. And what's gonna happen is the the sugar is gonna get against the cell wall and it's gonna start to pull moisture out. So but the moisture is from the inside of the banana leaf. It's not like we added water. It just comes out as we start to work it. Working. Yeah, yeah. So you see the, the juice is starting to come out. Yeah. And so the thing is juicy. Yeah. So now that it's juicy, and he got the juices flowing. What he's gonna do is put them into this jar. And we're gonna pack this jar up so that we get it two thirds full. So he's gonna fill them up to about two thirds right there. And two thirds is real important in natural farming uh, because um, it approximates the ratio that life is growing at, which is um, the golden ratio. And when you get, there's, there's some interesting, like, um, well, I don't know, I guess I'll talk about it. There's some interesting metaphysical ideas that if you take one divided by three, you get an infinite repeating fraction forever, 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 infinity. And so what I'm theorizing is that when we approximate this two thirds, we're also again at that repeating um, decimal and that you can actually pull energy out of a different dimension into this one by approximating two thirds. And that's why life is always about around a third or two thirds. So you see he got the material in here like this. The key is to pack this guy down and pack it down, pack him down and get him tight down there because we don't want any air down at the bottom. So you see how nice and tight I got it down. And you also see how starting to make liquid come out. Yeah, you guys can see how liquid is starting to come out. And that's because the sugar 
is pulling it out of the cells. And so I got most of it out. It's all packed on the bottom. And he's going to keep cutting a, a few more up and mixing uh, the sugar. So he's going to cut two more and then mix one more pound of sugar in there, lomium, till the moisture starts to come out of the cells. And then we're going to pack it in the jar. And I'm just going to go on from, from this point to kind of talk about the fermentation, this next step of what, what happens. So that as this material is in this container for three days, the liquid that comes out is, is just the juice from the plant. But if I take that juice and I spray it onto my other plants, it's not plant available. So it's not water soluble. So that's why this is called fermented plant juice. Because in the next three days, unless you had it in an air conditioned room, it's gonna take a little longer. But three days at room temperatures, it's going to ferment this liquid. So the little microorganisms that were on this plant material when he harvested it are designed to eat that material. Like they're just hanging out there waiting for the banana to die so they can eat it. And when we harvest it like that, they go to work on this juice. And so they start to digest the juice that comes out of here and they produce a weak alcohol. So they start, just like brewing beer, they start to eat it and produce um, CO2 and alcohol. And it's that alcohol that then makes this juice that came out soluble so it can go back into your plants so you take the you take the thing you you put the sugar to pull the juice out then the microorganisms that were on the outside of the of the banana leaf start to eat it and in three days they change it from being unavailable to the plant to very available to the plant and they make it water soluble so when you go to use this stuff it is immediately available by the plant. It doesn't have to digest it or eat it. It just can immediately go where the plant needs it to go. So this makes a very, very, very strong plant food because you're taking all the minerals and nutrients that were in this banana flower and make, and then when you spray it, you make it immediately available to whatever you're going to spray it on. You guys with me? Yep. All right. Um, Does it matter what material you use? So, so thank you for bringing up that question on material. In this case right here, we're using the banana flower. We are going to use the banana flower because this juice would then be good when any of my plants are starting to flower themselves. So if I see my tree and it's starting to put out flowers, this is the juice I would use. Now, if I wanted to have something for like young plant starts, very early starts, I would use something like a bamboo or something like a sweet potato or something like a guava, the, the guava branches, something that grows fast, that's vigorous. And those are the things I would ferment for that. In the case of this, where it's from the flower, it's, it's good for when your plant is flowering. You can also make this same recipe from fruit. And that would be good when your, when your trees are starting to put out fruit and starting to go into their reproductive and, and build fruits. So where you get it from, it goes back to kind of the same um, life cycle and stage. They cover all flowers, all plants? Yes. So, so it, um, it works for all plants. There are certain things like, like for instance, pineapple or lemons that are only good for pineapples and lemons. Banana is good across the board, can use banana on anything. But things that are very, um, you know, like, um, yeah, like sour, like, yeah, um, is citrus, like that is only good for itself. Um, other things I like to ferment is um, the comfrey plant because that one is very high in all kinds of nutrients. 
So plants that you know, the ones, the ones that they say, oh, that's real healthy for you. You know that that one's loaded with nutrients. So that one's a real good one to ferment, to then apply. So those same nutrients go right into your other plant that you're growing. So this here, this is done with guava. And this is the very, very tips of the guava where the leaves aren't even big enough to start um, producing sunlight. They're just the very, very tip of the plant that I took. And I took um, two people to gather this very early in the morning. And then we mix it with sugar, like this same method here. And this is the pour off coming out. And you'll notice majority of the plant matter is still here in the bucket. What I did was I only took out the best juice that is causing the plant itself to grow. Like most of the stuff um, in the plant isn't what you need to grow. It's, there's just um, liquids in there that are. So, so this process here of just composting it back to your plant is good. But in this case, what it enables me to do is when I use it on my plant, it immediately is able to go into the plant. Like on the order of it's going to start working in about a half hour to 15 minutes, the plant's already going to be like, oh, thanks for the food. But if I go and take compost and I put nice finished compost on the plant, it's still going to have to go through all the root system and then up into the plant. And so it may take a day, two days, a week to start feeding my plant. And so in the actual usage at towards the end, um, this is a, this like, do you, do you understand the difference? Like this is so immediately available. Um, so so at, at Tubbs place, I saw he has a fertigation where he's able to suck up the water and put it right out into the fertigation. And by far, that's the easiest way to do it. You dilute it properly, you put it into that system, it puts it out to your field, you're good to go. How I do it at my place is I have one small two gallon sprayer. I make my mixture, I go out in the afternoon and I just spray my plants. How I do it where I'm with the kids at the school I work at is they take the, the juices, they put them into watering cans and then they go out and they just water it all over. So if the method of using a sprayer to spray it on the underside of the leaf is the fastest way to get it to go into your other plant and be absorbed and use it. But if you already got your irrigation lines and you're just regularly putting it in there, it's more easy, yeah? And so what I do is I bought one of these syringes here. I got this from the animal um, store and this thing enables me real easy to measure out um, milliliters and also ounces. And so the dilution is one to 500. I wanna to talk to you guys about this. So, so Tubbs is done with this one. You see all the juice is starting to come out, but this thing is a little bit more than two thirds, huh? So I'm a real stickler. I'm gonna take a little bit out. Cause the two thirds really helps the microorganisms to work and do their thing because that extra air space on the top is how they communicate with each other. It actually, they produce gases and they receive gases and only when it's two thirds are they able to properly communicate with each other. Oxygen. You don't wanna wash it because like I said, it's, the, it's the, micro, or the, the microbes that are already on the outside that are then gonna do this next stage that we got the juice but we need those microbes to take the juice and ferment it into that alcohol so then it can be absorbed by our plant. So try not to wash your material. I know sometimes it's tempting, but try not to. And also, if you go to gather it, don't gather it when it's pouring rain or if it's just poured heavy rain because um, there won't be as much microorganisms on there. And so what we did is we just, we're gonna take this T-shirt, which is just a breathable lid and we're gonna put it on the top and then just secure it around so that other bugs don't get inside. So this is ready to sit for three days and the fermentation process to begin. 
What I do at my house is I put this inside my closet, inside the house. Um, even though it has plenty of sugar in it, it's so much sugar that ants don't even want it. Um, so, but I do it in, inside my house because then the temperature isn't going way up and way down. The core of my house is pretty steady temperature. And it's also not, like there's no sunlight. I put it in a closet, shut the door, and the thing is in there. Um, so this stage here, once it's fermented in three days, you should, when you open the thing, smell slight alcohol smell. If you don't smell it, that's okay. Um, um, between three to seven days, you should pour it off. So you see in this stage here, we're just gonna fast forward in time, and all of a sudden, here it is. I poured it off here, and this was after about four days. Because if you wait longer than seven days, or even, like, it's better to do it three to five, but if you wait longer, those microbes, you can get a secondary reaction. So all the real good juice that you just spent all this time and energy to make is gonna get broken down again, and it's not gonna be as good of a product. So you wanna take it from here, take it out of the material and pour it off, just like I did right here. And you pour it off and you get this liquid. And then this liquid, what I do is I mix that with equal parts of brown sugar again. So the thing has a lot of sugar in it, but there's no waste in this sugar. And when I first started natural farming, I was tempted to add less sugar and, and kind of cheat and just be like, oh, you don't need that much sugar. The more and more research and understanding I have of this, it's because when you add equal sugar to it, each water molecule that's in there gets a sugar molecule stuck to it. And if I'm a, if I'm a bacteria living in there, still alive, I go to eat that to take a drink I'm gonna drink water and sugar at the same time. And that's, you get so thirsty. I don't know if you ever just ate straight sugar, but you get so thirsty that the microbes in there just go to sleep. They're like, oh, there's no water to drink that doesn't have sugar with it. I give up, I'm just gonna go to sleep. And so this here, it, when I mix equal parts of sugar into this, it can't then go and be broken down again and turn into a, a junk product. It's, it's frozen as a really good pour off that has all the hormones and enzymes and everything that I collected from my banana in its pure form and ready and perfect for the plants to absorb. And it's not exactly equal part sugar, it's a little less, but you cannot add too much sugar and it's better to have more than less. So when you, when you get your practice and you start to do this, you'll see sometimes, oh, I got a layer of sugar at the bottom and, and stir it in good, stir it in real good. But you'll see like after a day, oh, I got a layer of sugar on the bottom and just note to yourself, okay, when I use banana flour, it's less sugar. Or when I use um, you know, this, it's, it's that much sugar. You know? So depending on your material, it's going to take different parts of sugar, but equal parts, you're guaranteed gonna get good results. Just a little bit more expensive for extra sugar. The extra sugar though, when you mix it with that equal parts, when you go to dilute it to use it, then the plants and everything eat it. So you never waste the sugar. It's always, it's gonna be used and it's going to go to your plants and they're gonna eat it it just helps to preserve it in this stage. Yeah? Yep, and like, like I showed in the slides, it's between half to two thirds of the weight. So if my material weighed three pounds, it would be um, what, two, one, a pound and a half to two pounds of sugar. So once you got it with your equal part sugar, you took the juice, you added equal part sugar, that thing should last three to five years. If you keep it out of direct sunlight, I recommend you put it in like um, brown. brown glass or brown paper bag around the thing so sunlight doesn't get in. And you can, you can store them in the fridge too if you like, um, but you don't have to.
I mean, it's going to last like 100 years if you start it in the fridge. Your fridge is going to rust before the thing. <laughs> so so it, seems, it seems sugary here, but once you dilute it 1 to 500, there's very, you know, like it's not any sugarier than anything else. So, yeah. Um, that is a good point, though. If you are experiencing heavy pest problems, this is a food and it will make your plants more susceptible to pests. So just like when you're sick, you don't feel like eating a whole ton of food, you can take this same stuff and dilute it even further, like one to a thousand, if your plant is already being hit by pests and is already sick. And that'll give it enough food, it's like just eating a few crackers when you're sick, that then you get enough energy to kind of recover. So same thing, if, if you're already experiencing problems, dilute more. It, um, it's great, it'll go into your compost and accelerate your compost. Um, what I do a lot of times if, for instance, this banana flower one, when I pour it off, is then I add in water and just cover it with water. Like after I've taken the juice out, cover the remains with water, and then I'll let that sit, and that will turn into a vinegar. And vinegar is also a very valuable farming input. And so you can make your own vinegar right from your waste from making FPJ, and then you can just keep that going. You know, after, after you make vinegar, then put it in your compost. <coughs> you take the vinegar off. Then I, yeah, and it takes, if you don't, if you just um, fill the remains up with water and leave it covered over, it'll take a bit between um, two to three months, but that will turn into a pretty strong vinegar. And then, then you would pour the vinegar off and then get rid of your solids. Yeah, if you seal the lid on that thing, I've had jars explode like yeah. big time and oh man, it's messy, especially inside my house in the closet. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. Uh, to make vinegar, you, you only speak in a banana or any of the uh, material that we use will do that? Um, any, anything that you ferment after with water, because there's still enough sugar on it, the sugar's already there and water, you'll produce a vinegar. If you seal that off from air or you put one of those things that's going to let the gas out, you would make alcohol. But anytime you're fermenting with access to oxygen, it's going to make vinegar, like acetic acid. So if you're going to be working with a fruit, where it's sweeter, you're going to want to add more sugar. But you may think, oh, it's sweet, why add more sugar? It's because to create that osmotic pressure, it needs, if it's already sweet, then it has sugar in there and there's not as much of a pressure differential when you put sugar on the outside. So you need more sugar to pull that out because it's sweeter on the inside. So if you're working with a real sweet fruit, um, more sugar. Um, and if you were to ferment something like tobacco, um, it would also have insect repellent properties. Um, and if you do something like, like neem or tobacco, something that you know is already really potent, um, be, start, start with a lighter dilution. So dilute one to a thousand before you start to just spray everything because you'll see it has different effects. And like I said, it's so immediately available that it just goes right into the cells that you could potentially overdose your plants. So you want to be careful. Um, this one here, this one was made from banana peel. So if you're in an industry that has peels or waste product left over, don't throw them away, ferment them. Because you're going to get all that nutrition back. You think this banana peel is not much juice in there? Look how much juice came out, plenty. So all your waste product can be fermented and you can get immediately available plant food. So this is one tool. This is going to be the food again for, for what we're doing. We're going to go now into a different demonstration. The next, the next input I wanted to talk about with you guys and show just a demo because it's, it's so easy to do and this is so useful and valuable. It's called lactic acid bacteria. Um, and this is a picture of it here. Um, it's just um, lact 
lactobacillus is another name for it, and lacto means long and bacillus means stick. So when they were looking through and they first saw it, they saw this long stick and they named it lactobacillus. Um, we primarily use it to eliminate smell in, um, in raising pigs and chickens, um, but it also functions as kind of like the National Guard. In terms of when there's an emergency, you can deploy the lactobacillus and it's kind of going to help get things going in again, you know? It's going to bring food, supply lines, help, help the other guys out, um, kind of like the Red Cross, you know, like aiding and assisting when there's a natural disaster type of idea. And so we make, um, here's my pigs, and they've been using lactobacillus. My chickens, they use it too. So lactobacillus long stick. And this is one of the Earth's most powerful and abundant beneficial microorganisms, meaning that it's all over your skin right now. It's in the air. It's on the table in front of you. It is everywhere. And I believe that that's why mammals, which produce milk, which is the lactose that it lives on, are the most dominant species on the Earth today. We're the most dominant as mammals because the lactobacillus is such a powerful, strong microbe. So when it dominates the micro world, it makes the world very easy for us who produce milk, its primary food, it wants to take care of us. And so it goes and cleans up things that would otherwise make you sick and die. The lacto eats it up so that its milk producer doesn't die. And so I believe that you know, that's, a, that's the reason mammals are so powerful, because of our link to this microorganism that is keeping us all alive and real healthy. It's one of the few microbes that can digest lactose. So there's a few different types of sugars, like glucose, sucrose, and lactose being one of them. And lactose is a mere image of the rest of them. So it's backwards. And so not all these other microbes can eat it because it's not, they don't have the keys to get in there because it's backwards, yeah? But lactic acid bacteria can and will and does. And it's naturally found in raw milk too. So any place you get raw milk from any mammal, it already has lactobacillus living in it. Um, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna go, come back to the usage. Um, so how we make this is with, um, I use white rice, the cowrose rice, um, just because that's cheap and available right now for me. And then you can cook it later and eat it yourself. Um, but what you do is you wash your rice. So you, it, who's, who's, familiar, who's unfamiliar with washing rice? So you guys all do it, right? Okay. So when you're first, when I put my rice into the pan, I just cover it with enough water and then I just massage it back and forth with my fingers and I get a really, really milky looking water and I pour that off. And I don't, you can wash your rice further if you like eat it, but for this, you just take that first pour off. So just the first one that you did, because that one is real, it's almost the color of milk, yeah, it's so cloudy. And you take that and you leave it out in a, here, here's the process here. So I, I washed the rice water and I left it out in this jar. And this jar is just sitting on my kitchen counter. Um, as long as it doesn't have a lid on, the lactobacillus are gonna be flying through the air and they're gonna land in that water. And so is everything else that lands in there. So all the bacteria that's gonna land and it hits it and the starch is a real easy food for it to immediately start eating. So it starts to colonize real fast. And within 48 hours to three days, this entire area over here is almost saturated with lactobacillus. It's, it's very predominant and, it's, and it feeds in there first. And if you smell the stuff, you'll kind of get this little bit of a sour smell to it. And that's the lactobacillus in there. And what happens is you get this film right on the top. Can you guys see that layer right there? It's the film on the top. And then the, most of the starch has settled down here on the bottom. 
and I don't want the film or this bottom. I just want this middle section. So here on this, I already destroyed the film when I poured it in here because it was in a bowl, but I put it into this bottle so I could bring it here. So I've already destroyed the film on top and mixed that in, but it's not the end of the world. But you see this here, this is now colonized with lactobacillus from the last uh, 12 to 15 hours that we had it um, sitting open. Um, and and if I, um, I don't know, I guess we could pass it around and smell it, but. So what we're gonna do is, um, like I said, we caught lactobacillus out of the air in here, but because we just left it open, we also caught other bacteria that may or may not be good for us. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna mix it with milk and basically milk, only the lactobacillus can eat the milk. Every other microbe that's living in here with the starch right now is like, oh, there's lots of food, I'm happy, I'm doing, having a good time. As soon as we pour it into the milk, they're gonna be like, oh, where'd all my food go? And the lacto is gonna be like, wow, look at all this food. So it's the only one that can then eat the milk. So what we're gonna do is take this thing that we got lacto, but we got other things, and we're gonna purify and select for just the lactobacillus via mixing it with milk. So, you like do them? Or... So Tub's gonna dump the milk in here. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Leilani is going to dump the milk in here. <laughs> yeah, uh, fill it up to two thirds if you can. And then, yeah. So because this is a real, real strong microbe, hitting your two thirds isn't exactly as important here because it's so powerful. But you want to be as close to it as possible. Right there. Yep. And then she's going to take this rice wash water that has the lacto in it and she's going to pour it in very carefully to make sure that none of the starch goes in from the bottom. And what I would have done if it was in a bowl is I would have skimmed this, this, this stuff off the top first. I would have skimmed that off with a spoon and then I would pour it in. And so you see she's real careful not to get the starch in there because if you get the starch in there, other things are gonna live in there and contaminate it because they can eat the starch, but only the lacto can eat the milk. Where did the starch come from? The rice, the rice wash. In, in the the rice yeah, yeah. Because when they, they mill it, there's extra and it gets there. So that's good. And yeah, I try, I always leave a little bit in the, the bottom, the last part, because it's almost impossible to get it, but this can just put it, compost them, it's good to go. So this is now inoculated. We now have, because it was, this was pasteurized milk, so they had cooked it and killed all the, the microbes living in here. We just now put them back in. Um, So what's gonna happen in, I cannot just snap my fingers and make this happen. So now we gotta go to hand waving pictures here of um, in 48 hours, what's gonna happen is this is gonna separate out and this bottom part is gonna be your whey and this top part is your cheese or your curds. And it, yeah, it takes, it takes about 48 hours. You're gonna starve off everything else. And you get a thing that looks like that. Um, and notice I covered the top with a, a breathable lid. This is just one paper towel that I had rubber band on the top. And, and the third process is to pour off the lacto, which I actually got a video of that. And the important thing to see here is that we got a clean separation, that all this curds is on the top. If you have things where it's kind of coming down and it's stringy still in there, like yogurt looking fingers coming down, 
If you got a little bit because it's on the edge of the jar, that's okay. But if your thing isn't into a firm sponge-like cheese on the top, you got contamination and it didn't work properly. So you want this thing up here to be firm. Like when I poke it with my finger, it's like poking a sponge. Like it's not, it's not like, you know, goopy. So I think this is, this is pouring it off, yeah? So see, I got the cheese on the top there and then the whey on the bottom. And as I pour it off, the cheese is one solid mass. It's not coming out of there. It's solid. I can even push my fingers on it and push it back in. And the thing is solid, yeah? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Firm like tofu. That's a good, uh, yeah, yeah. I should just make a video of all of them. <laughs> Come here, play videos. Just. Yeah, <laughs> yeah right. <laughs> when cardboard cut out in the video. <laughs> so. So real simple, you see I'm just pouring it off and then you'll notice kind of right at the end the thing splashes on me and oh, I was like, oh, it, it worked all right. But you try and keep all the solids out of this. Watch when I take them down, the thing went whoosh, filled up the last bit. Wait for it. Yeah, no, I was, because I had it almost at the, yeah, watch right there. And then, boom, all that water came out right then. I was like, oh no. <laughs> and some of, the, some of the solids went in there. So be careful when you're doing it. Um, I actually recommend, um, what I've been doing lately is I got a, a mosquito net. I bought it from Surplus Store and I just cut it into small things. And I just um, put it over the top and rubber band it on so that none of the solids come out when I'm doing it. And that's real easy to do. Um, and so then you get this cheese out of there and you can squeeze the cheese out and the, the water and it's just like farmer's cheese. Uh, I was telling the kids earlier you can make pizza right there with it. You know, your byproduct of farming is pizza. So yeah, you get, you get an, another useful product. Not only do you get whey, you get cheese. Um, and then, okay. And so then I take the thing and I'm, I'm just pouring, you see I had that whole jar full? I'm just gonna fill this other jar because basically I want it to be half full. And you'll see, I'll spin it towards you and you'll see it's um, at the 1,000 mark on these jars, 1,000 right there. And then that mark up there is 2,000. So working with the half gallon bell jars is real easy because it already has the measurements on it. And so what I'm doing is I'm adding equal parts of brown sugar. And I just buy a 50 pound sack of brown sugar. Um, and it's real easy to work with. Um, but, and you see that chunk of stuff in there? Well, failure, F right there. <laughs> try, try to keep that out. And so that's why using a screen, but that last little bit, put that in there. And then I'm stirring it with a wood spoon. And the important part is to stir it in real good. Because like I said, each molecule needs a sugar attached to it. And if you just put the sugar in, it all sinks to the bottom and then there's molecules without sugar on them. So you wanna stir it so that the sugar has a chance to attach to every single bit of liquid in there. And so I stir it for about um, three to five minutes. You know, where you're, where you're stirring it and you think it's mixed, stir it a little bit more. <laughs> and that's how to make this product. So I wanted just this last picture. I, I make this with my kids at the school. And um, in this one, or one of these ones, we just, we use chocolate milk and it worked too. Um, <laughs> but don't waste the chocolate, huh? Well, all the kids are like, what are you doing? <laughs> but, but you can use chocolate milk, you can use 1%. Um, skim milk, whole milk, you can use any kind of milk um, and it works. No, you cannot, cannot coconut milk. It has to, 
Yeah, yeah has yeah. to be dairy. Um, so I think, uh, and I think cow's milk is, is, is the best. Um, you could use goat or some other, you know, sheep milk if you like, but it's one, you dilute it one to 1,000. So it's half as much as your fermented plant juice. Okay, so what I, what I actually need to do is to put this up on the website so that you can just use this spreadsheet because it's real easy. But essentially, like if I wanted, I can just put in whatever value I want here. Like say I wanted to make two gallons, then all my dilutions and everything get adjusted to that. And so if I'm gonna use Lactic acid, oh, I'll make it five gallons then. Okay, so five gallons. I use a two gallon sprayer because I don't like to carry that much weight, but five gallons because Tubbs is more strong than me. Um, <laughs> this is the recipe right here to grow leaves. So if I want the plant to grow leaves, the other stage would be grow flower, and the next stage would be grow fruit but this is its growth stage. This is the way I would dilute my LAB. So I dilute it one to 1,000, and in five gallons of water, I would add 0.6 ounces or 19 milliliters, which that's why these guys come in super handy. Because right here, I can look at that and I can say, oh, you know, 0.6 or 15 milliliters. I go to my LAB, pull up the right amount, go to my water, boom, done. And so having a syringe like this, where it already has the measurements right on it, makes it real easy. And I recommend you figure out which dilution you want and print this out. And just wherever you have your area, like that you're mixing things, you just have one quick reference sheet. So how much of that, you know, just right there. And you have everything you need. So you'll notice when I go to use this LAB to grow leaf, there's way more other things in there. Yeah? And so that's the same with natural farming is that this FPJ that we made there and the LAB that we made here are just a few tools that you combine together to get the desired results. Because it's different if I want to grow leaf or if I want to make my plant flower or if I want it to make fruit, it's different. Uh, 100 square feet to a gallon. Okay, so, so when, I'm, when I'm watering heavy, like if I'm going through and I'm really trying to feed my soils plus my plant, I'm doing about a gallon per 100 square feet. So a 10 by 10 square, I'm putting about a gallon of spray there when I'm trying to do it heavy. And then if I'm doing it lighter than that, it's about, I, I do about a third of that if I'm just going for a light spray through. And to determine whether, you know, if, if for instance, I haven't been out to my garden and sprayed in the last week or two, I'll come out and do a heavy spray. Um, but if I'm just coming out to do different things, um, like, like for instance, after a heavy rain where it's washed away a lot of my nutrients, I'll just come out and do a light spray over the thing. And so, basing a lot on my feedback for what are my plants doing plus what is the weather doing determines how much i'm applying where and when but understanding like a heavy spray about a gallon per 100 square feet and uh um you know and then lighter than that to, to clean up um uh, so are there other uses for lab and the answer is yes um, like i said we use it to clean up um, animal waste and keep smell down. So um, typically when I'm going to clean up animal waste, I, I dilute it uh, less, like one to 20, because I'm just trying to quickly get a lot of LAB in there. Um, and if you, um, you know, if you got a stinky pig pen, you can go in and spray this and it will like really quickly eliminate the odor. Um, the odor will come back because LAB is not able to live there for more than two weeks. It's going to uh, use all of its food and then kind of disappear. 
So it's not a permanent solution, but it is a very quick temporary solution for getting rid of smell. Um, they also use this as a sanitizer. sanitizer. So in like the meat industry where there's um, presence of, of bad microorganisms, like, like E. coli, to say it's bad, sorry, E. coli, um, non-human compatible microbes, um, you can use LAB and essentially what it does is it eats up all the food that the other microorganisms living there would have eaten. And so the other, the other microorganisms population cannot rise anymore. And so you, it, it will sanitize the environment and bring it back to where it's compatible for mammals again, because LAB loves us. Um, I also use this as a laundry detergent. Um, it cleans your laundry really well. Um, you know, no smell. <laughs> um, <laughs> and um, no, 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 no. It's good. Um, what else do I use it for? Um, yeah, yeah. Sink. I, I use it instead of um, dish soap. I just I just use LAB. It cleans my dishes. Put it on. Um, stomach. Yeah. <laughs> stomach. So if you get if you have food poisoning and you drink like a tablespoon of this stuff, you will feel better in about a half hour. And if you don't, man, you got some problems. But. <laughs> And sometimes what I'll do is when I'm done with this, you know, when I'm, when I'm pouring it off and I, and I pour out my whey, I keep some pure whey in the fridge without mixing the sugar into it. And that will be my inoculum next time. So instead of going through that rice wash stage, I just take um, lacto that I've already isolated and kept in the fridge so it stayed, um, you know, didn't, didn't rot. And then I add that in as my inoculum. So, I don't know if I should have said that. <laughs> yeah, little little shortcut. Because once you once you've made it and you got it, then you know, if you add the sugar in. So if I took the the sugary stuff and I mixed it into this milk to try to get lacto again, that sugar is going to contaminate the batch. So as soon as you've mixed it with sugar, you can no longer use it as like a seed inoculum but I'll just keep a little bit in the fridge. And then that's my inoculum. What about um, using like some of this for like germinating seedlings and stuff, seeds? Any, any potential in that? Yeah, absolutely. The uh, question was about uh, seeds and using LAB. And if you look at this recipe right here, this one is the seed soak solution. And sure enough, this one doesn't have LAB on it. <laughs> Let me fix that. This one is supposed to, it's supposed to have LAB in this one. I don't know why it's not in there. I'll just For right now, we'll just make one quick edit. LAB in there. <laughs> Yeah, um, so, so if, when, you're, when you're starting to do natural farming, any little bits you can start to do are going to, you're going to see the results of them. When you, when you go and you get them all and they're all working, then you're going to reach, you know, like a new level of like, wow, my plants are really doing well. But starting with like, say for instance, you just had the FPJ and the LAB, because those are the ones you know about, start with those. And so in your seed soak, do those. And there's um, there's scientific papers which I I don't I, I've read them but I don't have them and I'm not even sure where I saw it from but it was a, a pretty reputable source talking about um, EM which is effective microorganism which is almost lactobacillus there's there's two other things in there 
um, in EM1, but it's mostly lactobacillus. And they talk about how when you use it, you get your first dicotyledons that come out, those first leaves that are stored in the seed that come out are twice as big when you use LAB. So your plant is able to get that super boost from the beginning. So its original leaves are even bigger. And one of the important parts is of using a seed soak is that when you start to put that lactic acid bacteria on the seed, then when your plant grows from that seed and gets bigger and bigger, the lactose starts to live on it and you get a cover everywhere. So there's no gaps on this plant. If it started from the seed and it was coated in lactobacillus, as it grows out, it's always covered and it has this protective layer versus if you came to a plant that's already there and spray the lacto on, you're gonna have little gaps here and there. And I'm talking like microscopic type of thing, but it almost grows with like a force field around it of like protection. Because if your leaf has a bare space with nothing there, that's a zone where if a pathogen's coming by, it's like, oh, it's like an empty house all loaded up with, with stuff. They're just gonna come in and take it, right? But if there's an LAB there, it, it can't get it. And so your plant has this extra protection when it's coated in this microorganism. And it lives on the plant because the plant will feed it sugars. So it's able to get sugars straight out of the leaf and, and back in. So it's gonna live on your plant when you put it on there. There's one on here that I don't recognize. I know it's off subject. What is the L? The L? Uh, it's maltose. Okay. And, and the reason maltose is in the seed soak is because malt comes out when uh, things are sprouting and that maltose helps that sprouting action. All the enzymes and things that are in there really boost it. I see somewhere that uh, LAB is good for uh, Oh, oh. So, so I think I think what Chris is asking about is sometimes in the beginning you get um, wilt, like bacterial wilt, and this helps because the bacteria that causes that wilt cannot get a stronghold on it, because all the sites where that wilt is going to plug in and start pulling nutrients out are occupied by the lacto, so it can help prevent. Um, so that'll come into the seed soak, right? You don't have to spray it on when it's sprouting. Yeah, you don't. You don't. And um, I made I made the analogy earlier that lactic acid bacteria is like the National Guard or the Red Cross, and so I want to go back to that analogy in a little bit, or to um, elaborate on that a little bit that. When you have an emergency and you deploy the National Guard out and they start, because I'm talking about this because we just had a hurricane in Hilo side and National Guard came to chainsaw all the trees that were across the road, yeah? And they really helped people out. So if you deploy them then during an emergency, they can really help you out and really do good things for you. And it's really good. But if there is no hurricane and you don't need them there, all of a sudden you just deploy the National Guard and all of a sudden they're making you stop at checkpoints and do all this stuff. It's all this additional cost that you don't need and it's not even helping you, right? So you wanna be judicious in your application of lactic acid bacteria. That they are very hungry and very expensive to use and they will help you out of an emergency. But if you don't have like, if I dig up the soil, that's a, for the microbes in the soil, they're like, oh, what just happened? You know, that's a big natural disaster for them. Prime time to use lactic acid bacteria. But if my soil, you know, doesn't have that and I use it, they're just going to eat up the food that my other microorganisms, like my IMO and my other indigenous microbes would eat. They're going to eat it all. And so if you're using like LAB on really ripe fruit, like your fruit, you're ready to pick it and you go spray LAB on it, it's going to take all the sugars out of your fruit and eat it. And you're going to eat the fruit and it's going to taste like cardboard. And be like, what happened? It's because you put LAB on it right at the end and they're real expensive and you didn't need it at that point. So you want to be careful when you're using this because it can be extremely helpful to you, but then it can also kind of eat up 
things you didn't want it to. Which this is an enhanced ripening. And this is uh, what Tubbs was talking about. This is another recipe. And this one is for right when you're about to pick your fruit. You want to make it even sweeter, even better. And you want it to have good skin so it doesn't crack. This is the recipe you use right at the end. And it has seawater. And the seawater is diluted 1 to 25, which is about 3%, yeah? or 0.3%, whatever. So you're going to hit this perfect ratio. And this. Is that the two days before you pick? What? How? So this is in, in your last week before you're picking, uh, anywhere in, the, in one week before you pick. So um, even. <laughs> Like, like I was saying, when we go to, when we go to use this stuff, um, you know, like in a fertigation or uh, spraying on or watering on, they're all really effective. If you can hit the fruit directly, it will go straight into those cells, especially, I mean, but, but to hit your, your, your mango example, if you can get it mostly on the underside of the leaf, so if you're under the tree and spraying it up into the canopy, like I don't know what kind of spray you get, but if you can get it, up into your canopy, then it's just going to absorb it through the bottom of the leaves. And the plant, um, in terms of how fast can something like move from this side of the tree to that side of the tree, and um, Elaine, was, who, who's one of the people that I learned from, did this experiment where they had a cave system that was about 500 feet below the ground. I think it was. It was way down there, and there's roots coming from this old growth forest on the top all the way down into this tree or into this cave. And they went into the cave and they took the roots and they sprayed a dye up into the roots way down in this cave. And they talked to the people up above, and within seconds, like not even like a whole minute, they were able to t detect the dye in the tree up on the top. So in terms of how fast does the stuff move through, it seems to be really, really, really fast. And I don't have anything more than just kind of a story like that, but it is fast. So he's looking into doing a calcium dip after you pick the fruit, dipping them in the calcium to give it a little bit more strength because a lot of the problem is the thing gets soft um, from you know different reasons, but as a dip afterwards and the fruit itself will absorb this calcium later. Doesn't even have to be like attached to the plant, can still go into the fruit. And the best time um, from Master Cho, he tells me is, you know, two hours before sunset, when the sun is down and it's no longer direct on you. That's the time, I mean, not only because it's cooler to walk around and do that, but also because the plant at that point is gonna absorb those nutrients before it goes into, into.